This video looks at a number of terrorist actors which are useful in area of study 4 to discuss terrorism as a crisis. In particular, we'll look at one example of state terrorism in Indonesia and one example of a non-state terrorist group, a religious group, Jamar Islamia. So what does the study design actually ask of us here? It tells us we need to learn about one group from at least two of the following categories. So for this particular video, that one group will be state terrorism, so one state terrorist actor, and a religious group, Jamar Islamia. And these images capture that. It's useful to choose these particular actors because they're contrasting. State terrorism, very different to non-state terrorism. It certainly allows for more discussion around what is terrorism, how is it defined, how can it be combated. If we begin with state terrorism and discussing Indonesia, how has Indonesia acted as a terrorist actor? Well, in one way, it's used Attachment 88, and it uses them to silence independence movement leaders, civilians. If we think back to our definition of terrorism, it typically involves violence or threats of violence. It targets civilians and is political. And in this case, we've got independence leaders who are civilians. They're not military leaders. A good example of this is the murder of the West Papuan leader, Marco Tabuni. And there's a video here that will open up um, that looks at the murder of Marco, um, how the Indonesian police were involved. And this is a good example of a, a case that you could use to discuss Indonesia acting in a terrorist way. It's just after 9am on Thursday the 14th of June and on this street in the Papuan capital a killing is about to take place. The target is this man, independence leader Marco Tabuni, seen here speaking just weeks before his death. He is like my family. He is a martyr of revolution. He is a leader of West Papua. I've never shot this. He's a good man. We feel a very great loss because he was clearly a leader. The whole of Papua deplores that Marco was killed illegally. He was shot dead just like that, as if he was a thief. The killing by police left parts of the city in smoking ruins after riots broke out in protest. At his funeral, thousands mourned Marco Tabini. Marco <laughs> His successor knows that he too is now in the firing line. The three days after Marco Taboni was dead by Indonesian, they, yeah, they sent a text message to me. They said to me that um, after Marco Taboni was dead, you are the next. You'll be next? Yeah, I'm the next. I mean, it's not new for us. It's already happened to us. Do you know where the message came from? I know that it's come from the Internet, Indonesian intelligence. The killing of Tabuni was a coordinated police effort. And 7.30's investigation in West Papua raises serious questions for Australia because the funding and training provided by Australia for counter-terrorism now appears to be being used to crush the Papuan independence movement 
and assassinate its leaders. We've come to West Papua to find out more about why Marco Tabuni was gunned down by police in broad daylight. And at this safe house on the outskirts of Jayapura, I'm about to meet two witnesses who were brave enough to tell us what they saw. Now, in both cases, the men fear for their lives, so we've agreed to conceal their identities. But their accounts are compelling. As activists, we already knew this was a game played against us, and we have strong reason to believe that this is the work done by Detachment 88. Detachment 88 is the elite Indonesian police unit established in the wake of the Bali bombing, trained in forensics, intelligence gathering, surveillance and law enforcement by the US, the UK and Australia. They've played a crucial role in Indonesia's counter-terrorism efforts. They're ruthless, often killing suspects. But their anti-terrorism mandate is now creeping into other areas, like policing West Papuan separatists. And human rights activists are concerned. Oh, there is no doubt that they are there in Papua. I believe that. This leaked video surfaced last year. It shows Detachment 88 after they'd reclaimed a remote airstrip from militant separatists. <laughs> The trophy video taken on a mobile phone by the police identifies Detachment 88 officers who are often embedded with other units. It shows dead Papuans lying on the ground and appears to include pictures of teenagers tied up with ropes. Here is a more brazen show of force. It's the Papuan National Congress last October when police opened fire on civilians. Witnesses say Detachment 88 was among the security forces that day. The fact is, Detachment 88 are in Jayapura. In 2009, Detachment 88 killed this militant Papuan activist, Kelly Kualik. He was a leader from the Free Papua Movement, or OPM, a violent independence group with a record of attacking military and civilians. The Papuan police chief praised the work of Detachment 88 in the killing, and later a WikiLeaks cable confirmed that a Detachment 88 team conducted the raid. But unlike OPM, Marco Tabuni's organisation, KNPB, says it is non-violent and instead pursues a political solution. His way of fighting back was by doing interviews and press conferences. It was gentle. He wasn't violent. People say he had weapons and so on, but I was often at his house and never saw a pistol, and nor did my friends. We really don't believe it. Marco Tabuni's final day began here, at this roadside food stand. A witness was with him and noticed several cars approaching. As soon as they got out of the car, they surrounded us. There were two of us, me and a friend, and Marco in the middle. As soon as they got out, all the other people there disappeared and hid. So they came into the food store and said, Good morning, are you Marco? The police chief would like to see you. The men had arrived in unmarked cars and plain clothes. Tabuni ran. He got free, he ran across the road, he ran about two metres alongside the taxi rank. He ran along the taxi rank and tried to climb down into a gully, a drain under the bridge. He was shot in the leg. He was shot but still tried to escape. Then they shot him in the torso. So this is the street where Marco Tabuni was shot. He came down here to buy some betel nuts to eat. A group of unmarked cars arrived, the police jumped out, tried to arrest him, he fled and they shot him right here on the left hand side. Now we can't get out and film here because ever since then 
The police have been keeping a very close eye on what goes on around here, and especially on people who try to find out exactly what happened. From here, Tabuni was thrown into the police van and taken not to the nearby Catholic hospital, but to this police hospital at least 20 minutes away. This witness saw the authorities bring him in. He came in. I was shocked. I didn't know what had happened, and it was a shock. They brought him in, and all they did was wash off the blood. <coughs> This eyewitness says the police were from Detachment 88. I could tell just from the way they looked. And when they brought him in, the people carrying him were wearing masks. There were two wearing masks, the ones who had hold of him and they took him into the emergency ward. So I'm going to stop the video there, but it gives you a good idea of some of the actions of Detachment 88 in West Papua, and it gives you a specific example of one action, that is the killing of a civilian um, to intimidate, so for political reasons, to intimidate other independence leaders. There are other examples of the military in West Papua um, you know, causing the deaths of thousands of West Papuans, and also the fact that there are now laws which lead to the arrest and imprisonment of anyone who flies the Papuan flag, the, the Morning Star flag. So you put these together and it paints a picture of one potential terrorist state. And the key word is their potential. It would be a brave person to go out and say Indonesia is a terrorist state, but your language around Indonesia as a terrorist state is going to be one which is about allegedly committing terrorist acts or it could be argued that Indonesia is a terrorist state or, or supports terrorist acts. So several reasons why Indonesia would want to use violence. One, they can use it to eliminate the threat to their sovereignty, the threat of independence of secession of West Papua. And two, they might actually use violence to stamp out terrorism but also this can have the unintended consequences of harming civilians. And three, there are other political reasons to appear tough, not only to neighbours, but also to other secessionist groups who might try and separate and secede from the state. There are a number of quotes here, which I won't read through, but you can pause this video and read through these. They are quotes from a colonel who has been a leader in one of these regions and his views on separatist movements and how they should be crushed. <clears throat> one particular theory about state terrorism is that it is in fact worse than non-state terrorism. And this particular author um, states four reasons why that's the case. The first one says that acts of terror are far worse because of casualties. States have the capacity to cause far greater casualties because they are in control of their military. So they have far more resources available to them. State terrorism is worse because of the secrecy and deception associated with the acts. So states can justify acting in secrecy. Um, state terrorism can be worse because it actually breaches the moral codes which states typically preach to other global actors. And so if they undermine these codes, then it's, it's possible that there are repercussions for other global actors who now can also violate the same codes. And finally, if we consider that terrorism is often the only course of action available to non-state actors, we have to remember that this isn't the case with state actors. State actors have many courses of action available to them, many types of power that they can use. Diplomacy, political power, economic power. Often, non-state actors don't have access to these other types of powers. There are a few questions here which you may wish to attempt. In contrast, we have a non-state religious terrorist group. And we're going to look at Jamar Islamiyah as that group 
you have an image of the leader here who was arrested and is currently serving a prison sentence in Indonesia. He was implicated in the Bali bombings of 2002. So the aims of JI are to establish a pan-Islamic state across Southeast Asia. So a new state in place of where Indonesia, Malaysia and the Philippines currently are. And they want this to be governed by a very strict version of Sharia or Islamic law. What they also wish is a pure form of Islam, a very strict following of the Quran. Their roles involves increasing their supporter base, but also performing terrorist acts. Terrorist acts to increase awareness of who they are um, and to intimidate um, Western people and Western businesses in the region. In terms of their power, their power has been shifting. So they have the power to plan and execute large scale bombings. And we'll have a couple of examples in a moment. They also have the power um, to work with terrorist cells across the region. However, their influence has been waning in recent times because of counterterrorism programs like Detachment 88. More and more of JI's operations have been caught out, investigated, stopped before they were executed. And they've had less chances to increase their um, number of, of terrorists. So their influence has been diminishing in recent years, especially since the forming of Detachment 88. A couple of examples here of this terrorist, this non-state actors um, actions, the 2002 Bali bombings, first and foremost, probably the most significant. However, there are also attacks on the Married Hotel and the Australian Embassy. All three of these attacks are against Western targets. They're political in nature. They're meant to intimidate the Western influence in the region. There's a statement here from JI, um, which clearly says that they're attacking Australians, that they want Australians. It says, quote, we advise Australians in Indonesia to leave this country or else we will transform it into a cemetery for them. It goes on to talk about the presence of Australian troops in Iraq, in a Muslim nation. So they're clear in their goals. They are political goals and they're not going to hesitate to attack civilians in order to achieve those political goals. A couple of questions here to help you with the non-state religious group, Shamar Islamiyah. 